special. Um, I find myself, I've been looking forward to them for so long, and I hope that we all look forward to them quite a bit. So without further ado, Om Gyanati Mirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasma Shri Guru Venama Shri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Shtapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Namini Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesh Shunyavadi Pushchatya Deshatarine Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sadi Gauravakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Vancha Kalpatarupyascha Kripa Sindhupya Evacha Patita Nam Pavanipyo Vaishnave Vyonamanama So this is the, the lecture uh, where I've been wondering can I talk about this devotee this day? And then it, it would kind of like nope, the next day. And I'm wondering, can I talk about this devotee this day? And it would keep going the next day, may, maybe, maybe that next day. But now finally, it's here. Uh, so the devotee that I wanted to speak about was Sri Goridas Pandit. And it happens to be his disappearance tomorrow. Goridas Pandit, if any of us had been together when we spoke about Shamananda Pandit, Shamananda Pandit is one of the favorites of the devotees for his miraculous pastimes. Shamananda Pandit wound up creating, establishing his own sampradaya called Shamanandis. And he had so many dealings with Srimati Radharani. Shamananda Pandit had a guru whose name was Kridai Chaitanya, which means one whose heart is the, the resting place or the residence of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Kridai Chaitanya, his guru, was Goridas Pandit. So Goridas Pandit is a very wonderful, uh, interesting personality. He hails from a small town named Ambika Kalna. And Goridas Pandit's temple is located in Ambika Kalna. And he has worshipable deities of Shishi Gaur Nityananda. Uh, one day, Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda were coming to Ambika Kalna from Shantipur, where Sri Advaita Acharya lives. And they came by boat and they happened to be paddling the boat themselves. And when they got to Ambika Kalna, Lord Chaitanya kept the boat, the oar of the boat in his hand. And as he, as he walked into Goridas Pandit's house, he gave it to him. And what he said is, with this oar, you should cross over the ocean of material existence and take all the living entities with you. So how incredible is this Goridas Pandit who has somehow the ability to have the oar which can ferry us across material existence quite literally within his home. And it is still there today. Um, and so if you go on pilgrimage throughout Navadweep and you head to Ambikakana, you can actually still see the oar. And another, how cool is that? Also about Goridas Pandit, um, he had an older brother named Suryadas. Suryadas happened to have two daughters. Their names were Sri Vashuda Devi 
and Janaba Devi. We will get to those pastimes in just a moment. Um, <clears throat> when Mahaprabhu decided to accept sannyas, he came personally to Ambika Kalna to bid farewell to Gauri Das. And Gauri Das was completely just beside himself with grief. Gauri Das cried profusely and piteously. He fell at the Lord's feet and he begged him, please don't ever, ever go away from here. Uh, just to honor this one request that the two brothers stay there with him and never leave him. Sri Gauranga Mahaprabhu replied that he would be forever present in the form of the deity. He said, no problem, I'll always be, I'll always be here as a deity. Um, finally, Goridas should have been pacified. Mahaprabhu had done this with many other devotees. I cannot be here personally, but please worship my deity for me, give them a deity for me, they would be okay. Uh, Gauri Das was not so happy with that. In fact, he had the deity form of, of Gauri Nityananda. And at one point, he looked at Gauri Nityananda, his deities, and he looked at Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda, the lords, and he would sometimes say, okay, okay, you, you can go. And then the Lord would stand up to leave. No, no, wait, wait. If you say that you are non-different from your deity form, then how do I know who is the deity? And how do I know who is the real Gaur Nityananda? And so then he would look to the deities on the altar. He said, okay, you can go. And these two can stay. Lovingly, Lord Chaitanya, he abided by his request. The deities on the altar slowly changed their position, put their arms down, walked off of the altar, and they stood in front of Gauri Das Pandit, and then Lord Chaitanya and Lord Ajananda resumed their place on the altar. Gauri Das Pandit, looking at this, would somehow seem a little bit confused. He said, no, 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 wait, wait. You two on the altar can, you two can go, and then you two lords, you stay here with me. And so about three times or so, this switch occurred until it got to the point where no one, no one knew which were the, the real Gornityananda and which were the deity forms. How wonderful it is, even to this day, that no one really knows which, which forms of the Lord actually stayed with Gori Das Pandit and which ones went on to continue their pastimes. So how amazing is it that for us and our deities, we should remember this. We can remember that the deity form does not have to be any different from the Lord of our hearts. In fact, Gauri Das Pandit would have many, many incredible pastimes with these deities. He would call them naughty. He would he would call them, he would say, why are you so restless? One time, Gauri Das Pandit was trying to cook for all of the deities. And he would speak to the deities and the deities would tell him, don't worry, we will accept everything that you have cooked. We will accept everything personally. They would speak to him quite often. One day, the lords of his heart told him, O oh, Goridas, previously, you were our cowherd friend, Subal. Don't you remember how we used to play and frolic? Don't you remember how we used to enjoy so many games on the banks of the Jamuna? Suddenly, these lords of his heart would take the form of Krishna and Balaram. They would be dressed like cowherd boys. They would hold buffalo horns and a cane, and flutes, and plow. They would have peacock feathers, and all kinds of necklaces, and garlands, and berries, and forest flowers. Goridas would then look at himself, and somehow his previous appearance would manifest. And then the Lord would have fun with the deities. 
After some time, Goridas would calm himself, and then the Lord again would sit back on the altar. Imagine, just imagine. Gora Chandra at the Bhakti Center happens to be incredibly sweet. And I find myself often praying to him. But imagine, imagine if he answered back one day, would I actually be ready? Would I be ready? If the Lord of my heart, I'm praying to him so much, he's so sweet, would turn, oh, would you to go be? Don't worry so much about whatever it is that I'm probably worrying about. Don't worry about it so much. I've personally taken care of everything. Would, would I, firstly, would I even believe it? How many times is our Lord speaking to us and we just refuse to believe it? Just as Goridas Pandit, he did not see any difference between the physical manifested living forms of Gaur Nityananda and his deity forms of Lord Nityananda. Somehow, I refuse to see past the doubts. The doubts in my mind are so incredible that they have formed a deity all of their own. And I have ascribed to that deity all of my prayers. So while Goridas was having all of these wonderful conversations with his deities, I just find myself having my conversations with my deity of doubt. And then when the Lord answers my prayer, I convince myself, no, it can't be, it can't be the Lord. It can't be the deity having dealings with me. It can't be the Lord of my heart having pastimes in my life with me. This has to be my mind. How is it that we remain so unconvinced? I was at an initiation ceremony last, last weekend. And we were speaking about, of course, the 10 offenses against chanting the holy name. One of which is to maintain so many material attachments, even after understanding so many instructions on the glories of chanting the holy name. For me, I kind of want to change that because perhaps it's not so many material attachments, but for me in my mind, it is maintaining and upholding, lovingly worshiping so many doubts and misgivings even after hearing and understanding so many instructions on the glories of chanting the holy name. A friend asked me yesterday, and I said, can you tell me something about the holy name? They were going to chant their japa. They said, can you tell me something about the holy name? I said, sure. The holy name can give us anything and everything. The holy name can give us every single thing that we could have ever desired and all of the things that we never even thought to desire. And yet, somehow I remain unconvinced. It is actually, possibly, an offense to the holy name not to be convinced in the power of the holy name. So Goridas Pandit was so convinced that his deities would have so many loving pastimes with him. On one such occasion, he chased the deities off of the altar with a stick. And the deities ran off of the altar and they were running away from him and he's chasing them with a stick, not unlike Mother Jishoda. But he chases them with a stick and they run into the heart of his foremost disciple, Chaitanya. And this is how Chaitanya that day gets to be known as Hridoy Chaitanya, one who has Lord Chaitanya within his heart. Goridas Pandit would weep in ecstasy, seeing so many of these pastimes, as would we all. Hopefully, if we got to see any anything like this, how incredible would it be 
The Lord jumps off the altar, runs into somebody's heart, comes back out later. <laughs> Thankfully, reestablishes himself later. But just to see the Lord having these pastimes. We can see the Lord in the dream. We wind up questioning it for the next two years. Was that real? Is this my imagination? Is the Lord showing up? Am I a sahaji? Am I just manufacturing things? Have I become a mental speculator? What is all? Sometimes we can accept that the Lord is showing his mercy upon us. Do we deserve it? Probably not. But that's the definition of causeless mercy. And so sometimes we are thinking, oh, but I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. Who said that the, 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 the prerequisite for mercy was us deserving it? In fact, that's not the prerequisite. The prerequisite for mercy is that we don't deserve it. That's, that's what makes it mercy. Through no fault of our own, it's coming upon us. So Gauri Das Pandit was having so many different interactions with the Lord. He didn't have to question them. Not then, at least. And so likewise, when we are having these interactions with the Lord, we should write them down. We should reflect on them. Sometimes, sometimes when it comes to acting, our actions, that can get a little bit difficult to navigate. Which way do I move? How do I move? Where do I step? Where do I go? But those interactions with the Lord that we have had should not be second guessed. Our Acharyas have said that whenever and wherever the Lord appears, he is always perfect, complete, eternal, and fully manifest. This includes dreams. Even Srila Prabhupada says, if you have dreams about the Guru and about Krishna and spiritual personalities, these are not simply dreams. These are our interactions with the Lord and these personal associates. There are so many, so many people who have received instructions from their Guru, instructions from so many people, instructions from the Lord within a dream, and then we wonder, why don't these things happen to us? Well, they could. Um, and I dare say, with a lot of us, they, they are. They would happen. But would we even believe it? Or would we go back to our temple of misgivings and our deity made of doubts and we put all of our faith over there? So now coming to the brother of Gauri Das Pandit. Surya Das and his two daughters, Vashuddha and Janava Devi. So from the pages of Sri Chaitanya Bhagavat, we hear about the story of the marriage of Lord Nityananda. One day, Lord Nityananda woke up early in the morning and set out for Ambika Nagar, also known as Ambika Kalna. He took a servant with him, Udarandat, who was a merchant by profession and his intimate associate. When Lord Nityananda arrived at the door of Suryadas Pandit, he sent Udaran Dutt inside the house. Udaran went inside and informed Suryadas of the Lord's arrival, and so he rushed out to greet the Lord. Falling at the feet of Lord Nityananda, Suryadas offered his obeisances. Then with folded hands, he said, Oh, what good fortune! The Lord said, I have come to you with a purpose. Please give me your daughter's hand in marriage. Lord Nityananda is nothing if not direct. The Pandit knew the glories of Nityananda Prabhu, but at that moment he forgot everything, being bewildered by the Lord's illusory energy. How is it possible? The Brahmin humbly said. We first have to weigh many considerations, such as caste, the stars, and family. Although you are the Supreme Personality of Godhead Narayan, you are an outcast, and I am a Brahman. Hearing this reply, Nityananda Prabhu left that place while everyone watched in wonder. How incredible is this? There are so many considerations 
even down to caste considerations being considered, and this is the Lord of the Universe. He's none other than an Anthadev who is man maintaining all of the universes on one of his hoods like it was no more than one mustard seed. You ever try and hold and balance a mustard seed on your finger? It's difficult. But it's not, it's difficult because it's small and rolling everywhere. Not difficult because this is heavy. This is nothing for, for Lord Ananta Dev. And this is Nityananda Prabhu. Amazing how Surya Das can say in the same one breath, I know you are the Lord of the universe. You are Lord Narayan. You're also an outcast. No one knows where you come from. And Lord Nityananda was very fond of also not telling anyone where he came from. He traveled on Yatra with a, with a qualified Brahmin. He met Madhavendra Puri. He had so many dealings. He could have told everyone about his high exalted status. He was the son of a Brahmin. He chooses not to. He lives as an Avadut, an outcast, kind of doing his own thing, outside of the stringent laws of society. And so how amazing that when we see people living on the outside of the laws of society, we can kind of judge them. You could be the supreme personality of Godhead. But then he says, but can I marry your daughter? And then all of the doubts come in, all of the misgivings. I don't know. I don't know how we're going to convince the family. I don't know how we're going to make sense of this. I mean, I know you're God, but still also, I mean, there's society to be considered. How amazing. Somehow there was still society to be considered. That there would be society to be considered with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Surya Das Pandit felt disappointed and he later went inside his house. Will my dream ever come true, he thought. Oh Lord Krishna, will it ever come to be by the arrangement of providence that Nityananda Prabhu will become my son-in-law? My question is, if this is what he wanted, why didn't he just agree? Such are the illusory pastimes of our Supreme Lord. Pondering this, Surya Das assembled his relatives and informed them of the Lord's proposal. Last night, he told them, I had an astonishing dream. I saw a wonderful person come to my house, sitting on a chariot with a flag. He was huge, like a mighty wrestler. His complexion was golden and his eyes were reddish. He got down from the chariot and smilingly asked, Is this Panditji's house? He carried a plow on his shoulder and held a stick in his hand. He gestured for me to come forward. Flowers decorated his hair and he wore golden earrings. He was dressed in blue garments and anklets decorated his feet. He said to me, I am going to marry your daughter. You have not recognized me until today. Saying this, he suddenly disappeared. I then got out of bed and found that it was morning. As Janava Devi listened to her father's talks from within her room, her natural love for the Lord arose within her heart. Indeed, tears of love began to flow from her eyes. She covered her face with cloth, but the cloth became soaked with her own tears. My dear friends, I have told you about my wonderful dream, Pandit continued. We see so many things in our dreams, sometimes, someone replied. See, once again. Now the Lord is interacting with somebody in a dream. Here we go. Now normally we would think, oh, my Nitai has come in a dream? Let me believe everything he said. Let's see what the family says. We see so many things in our dreams, someone replied. Nityananda Prabhu is the Supreme Brahman, and we are but householders. How can we offer him our daughter? Surya Das Pandit was naturally very soft-hearted. Upon hearing this, he became distressed and cried, Oh, save me, save me. Suddenly, everyone heard a cry coming from inside the house. Something had happened to Janava. They rushed inside and picked her up and then brought her out onto the front veranda. 
She was unconscious and her eyes had rolled upwards in their sockets. Her entire body had become cold and her face was covered with perspiration. A doctor came and diagnosed that she had epilepsy, saying that there was no cure for this disease. He informed the girl's relatives that seldom does a person with epilepsy live for very long. He then treated her according to the prescriptions of the scriptures. Even after ap applying proper medication, there is no improvement, the physician said. Best to take your daughter to the bank of the Ganges and arrange for her funeral rites to be performed. Now, how incredible. The result of doubting the Lord when he appears in our lives is this. What incredible misfortune. Janava Devi now is on the brink of, of death. What will happen to us if we continue to maintain so many attachments to the doubts in our minds, even after understanding so many instructions on the glories of the Holy Name and the glories of the Lord of our heart? What will become of us? I feel like this is a very serious predicament. Let's see. Surya Das began to cry when he heard these words. Goridas, hero of today, while consoling him said, I think we have committed an offense at the feet of Avadut Nityananda. We must beg his pardon and bring him back here as soon as possible. As long as we live in this world, we should try to maintain relationships. After death, relationships no longer exist. If he can revive our daughter, then we should arrange for her marriage with him. This is my advice to all of you. Let us all go to Nityananda Prabhu and fall at his feet. In essence saying, these relationships with society and with all of these other people, maintaining so many attachments to relationships is only so good as long as Janava is alive. All of these considerations about who we should give our daughter to or not can only be held for as long as she's alive. If our daughter is gone, who cares? And if this, if this can revive her life, best that we give our daughter to Lord Nityananda with all pomp and circumstance. Lord Nityananda was sitting under a banyan tree on the bank of the Ganges. Tears glided from his eyes as he chanted the holy name of Krishna. Imagine that kirtan, that japa. Gauri Das, along with his relatives, went to Nityananda Prabhu and fell at his lotus feet. The Lord quickly picked him up while patting him on the back. My dear coward men, have you all forgotten me? The Lord said. Nityananda Prabhu placed his hands on Surya Das's shoulders. Now, we already understand. If he's referring to them, my dear cowherd men, because Gauri Das Pandit was none other than Subal. So they would, they would have these dealings. And Nityananda would often address them as such. Surya Das Pandit fell at the feet of Nityananda Prabhu and lamented, You completely bewildered my intelligence. Although you are capable of doing anything, you did not inspire me to give up my attachment for Vanashram Dharma. Please give us shelter of your lotus feet and thus save us. This is a line that I have put into my loving arsenal of arguments to give to the Supreme Lord whenever my mind goes out of control. My mind goes out of control and convinces me that Krishna can't possibly be blessing me. And then Krishna gives me the blessings. And then I feel as though when my friend is standing there looking like, and where was the faith that you to go be? I bring back this line. You didn't inspire me from within. Oh my Lord, you are the cause of all causes. You can do anything. So then why didn't you inspire me from within to give up these attachments to my misgivings and my uncertainties? Nothing can happen without you without your divine inspiration? This is the loving, the loving nature of the devotees in the Lord. And funny that our Lord Nityananda does not chastise him for this. He's simply happy 
to receive the hand of Janavadev. Saying this, the pundit took Lord Nityananda to his home. His daughter Janava was lying at the doorstep, covered with a cloth as the sunshine fell upon her. This appeared like lightning striking a cloud. Her eyes bulged in their sockets as tears incessantly fell from them. Her curly hair enhanced the beauty of her forehead. The symptoms of impending death appeared on her body. At that moment, the aroma of the Lord's body entered her nostrils. By smelling this aroma, she immediately regained consciousness. Sri Nityananda Prabhu Ki Jai. And this is how he saved the life of Janava Devi. He does go on to marry her, spoiler alert, happily. And then, after the marriage of Janava Devi, he's having lunch at their home. And while cooking that lunch, Vashuda Devi is cooking with both hands and her veil slips from her head. She manifests another two hands in order to put it back. Um, seeing this, Lord Nityananda is quite intrigued. And as she goes to serve him his lunch, he catches her by the right hand and says, you can come sit next to me. And then he tells Surya Das Pandit, he says, Oh, Surya Das, you have not given me a dowry. You have not given me any kind of dowry for marrying your daughter. And so I will now request one. I will take your other daughter, Vashuda, with me also. Uh, and so this is how Lord Nityananda attains two wives, Janava and Vashuda. Um, I thought it quite appropriate that Gauri Das Pandit's disappearances tomorrow and that he factors so deeply in this pastime. It is on his recommendation that Surya Das finds a way to end their problem and speak to Lord Nityananda. We can hopefully turn to our devotee family members and gain some help. We should also know that just as in the family of Surya Das Pandit, there were people who were saying, how can we do this? He's a scream lord, how can we give our daughter to him? When really they had so many other misgivings. It is important to note that we will find family members of two kinds. Even within our family of devotees, there will be family members who will tell us, no, 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 you can't do that. Stay in your lane. And there will be other family members who will finally say, I think, maybe. We should give up the doubts and find a way to follow what Krishna has said. The, the inspiration that Krishna has placed within our hearts. So we should not feel too bad when there is pushback or resistance. That's natural. There was even resistance to Lord Nityananda's marriage. I also felt like it was incredibly appropriate because Balaram Purnima is coming. And what better way than to speak about the wonderful pastimes of Sri Nityananda Balaram. And what better way than to revel in his beautiful inspiration from within than to think about and reflect on these beautiful pastimes and about how these doubts and misgivings can sometimes endanger our entire spiritual lives. But by surrendering to the lotus feet of Lord Nityananda, just as everyone else did on the advice of Goridas Pandit, by completely surrendering to the lotus feet of Lord Nityananda, all of those doubts can be completely and fully eradicated. Somehow, by making a connection with Lord Nityananda, our lives, our spiritual lives, can be saved. By making that connection with Lord Nityananda, we can stop the offense of maintaining so many attachments, even to our doubts and in the mind. Even after understanding so many instructions on chanting the holy name, Lord Nityananda can save us 
and he can give us the real purport of the chanting of the holy names so that maybe one day maybe one day we too can be reading back on this pastime and it won't just be words we will have a vision of lord nityananda sitting under a tree tears incessantly flowing from his eyes as he chants the holy name of the lord Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Vaishnav Thakur Ki Jai. Shri Nityananda Balaram Ki Jai. Shri Kadashi Titi Ki Jai. What do I? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's let's see if we have any questions. Uh, back to David. Hari Krishna, thank you for another beautiful class. Um, you know, I have to say that I have no doubt that I have been blessed by Krishna. But doubts are a very funny and strong thing because sometimes the doubt of what if we've got it all wrong creeps in and it's so annoying to me that you can have such different thoughts about Krishna first you think you're blessed by Krishna then you think well what if we got it all wrong yeah yeah <laughs> like you know but yes I agree that it's, it's amazing to me that you have doubts <laughs> thank you for a beautiful class I think the doubts are a natural part of, of growing in our spiritual lives I mean Arjuna is telling Krishna, Oh Madhusudan, you can dispel the doubts in my heart. Oh killer of the Madhu demon, you are so proficient at killing demons. Kill the demon of, my, of doubt within my mind. Somehow or other, I need you to make sense of all of this. So I think that that part is completely natural for us to feel confused and bewildered. But isn't it something, you know, you feel at a certain point that the doubts should stop. And then you see all of these pure devotees, and even at the ends of their life, Haridas Thakur, he still had some doubts. You know, what? If, I've been doing this a long time, but what if it's not enough, Lord? What if I didn't complete, you know, my, my, my allotted number of rounds? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is saying, you don't have to worry about that anymore. The Lord himself is coming to console him. So my only hope is that the Lord himself will continue to show up in my life through so many different avenues, disguised or undisguised, and and console me throughout the doubts because I don't know. I don't know if they stop. <laughs> There's a question in the chat. Sure, which is, uh, which one? I think Baba Devi. Ah, about facing and releasing the doubts. Ah, that was a commentary. She was saying that sometimes we need to face and release the doubts and only feeling them can reveal them to you. I mean, maybe. I mean, I, I think that that is the first step as any uh, person in spiritual rehabilitation is coming to find out that acknowledging that we have a problem is the first step to fixing it. Right, we can't, we can't, we can't fix anything that we are refusing to acknowledge. And so, just like in this in this pastime, we are seeing that until they actually acknowledge that maybe what we said to Lord Nityananda is not correct. Maybe we should go and, and, and figure out a way to go and speak with him and, and take back what we said. So yes, I do agree. Uh, once, we, once we start actually acknowledging that they are there, this becomes the first step in us trying to fix them. It's the first step in surrender is, is trying to figure out that these are bigger than me. This is much bigger than me. This, this, 
demon of doubt that likes to drag me away from my devotional service might be a little bit bigger than I'm equipped to handle. But nothing is too big for Krishna. Like those cowherd boys who were looking at the mouth of Agasura. And they were looking at him and thinking, hmm, I think we should go in. And interestingly enough, Krishna was standing some ways away. But if we notice, there is one person missing from this pastime. A person who might have given some clear thinking. Balaram was missing on that day. Uh, interestingly enough, it happened to be that when Krishna killed Agasura, it was Balaram Purima. It was Balaram's birthday, and so his mother kept him home. He had to do so many things. He had so many responsibilities. Given charity, performed so many ceremonies, all these things, so he stays home. And so all of the boys look into the, into the big mouth of this demon, and they think, I think maybe it's a demon. And they think, well, maybe it's a cave. Maybe it's a this. And some people, no, I absolutely think maybe this is a demon. Now, you or I might think, I think this is a demon, let's run the opposite direction. These adventurous boys think, this is a demon, let's charge in. Let's see what's at the end. And some of them are thinking, are you not afraid? No, we're not afraid. Krishna's there. Look, he's right there. He's playing his flute, everything's fine. Krishna saves us on a daily basis. It'll be fine. And with that faith, they charge into the, into the belly of the beast, quite literally. Into, into uncertain danger. Sometimes we have to look at our doubts and remember, Krishna's right there. He saves us every day. This particular doubt, that doubt can't be big enough to, to drag me away because Krishna's right there. And Krishna indeed was right there and so in touch with his devotees that he thought, oh, let me go save them immediately. Interestingly enough, okay, they had died. So there was that. You know, you think, it's like, well, you know, what's the worst that could have happened? Yeah, they died. Uh, and then Krishna revived them, brought them back to life, as he does several times throughout these pastimes. So the worst did happen. Sometimes our doubts try to tell us, well, what's the worst that could happen? The worst happens, and then what? And then Krishna saves us. So the worst happened with the boys. They died that day, and Krishna brought them back to life. And they were just so happy. As soon as Krishna brings them back to life, it's like a cooling shower. He glances over them, everything is fine. They get up, they joke, they laugh, they play. But that was a very, I can only imagine you ever have a day where you think you're like, that was a long day. This was a long day for Krishna. In the morning, the boys charge into the mouth of a demon. They get themselves killed. Krishna expands himself, suffocates said demon. The demon kind of explodes into a lot of like strange goo and demon juice. Now there's a big snake demon, several miles long, laying in the midst of Vrindavan. And that was just the morning. He saves his friends, brings them back to life. Then he just wants to have lunch. He sits down to have lunch. And that same day, Lord Brahma arrives and says, let me test this boy. I have doubts. Lord Brahma has doubts, right? I can't believe that he would be the Supreme Person. And so he steals all the boys and the calves. Same day, Balaram Purnima. Imagine, I can only think that Krishna is thinking, this is a long day. They died in the morning, I lost them in the afternoon, I had to become them in the evening, and now here we are. An entire year. And this is still nothing for Krishna to maintain. You see people and they're trying to maintain two romantic relationships at the same time and then they're getting confused and they're confusing one person's name with the other person's name. And Krishna was maintaining being all of the boys and calves for a year. 
and he wasn't confused. So sometimes those doubts come in. Sometimes those doubts are integral. They're actually important to the pastime. So sometimes we think, oh, but there's so many doubts. Doesn't that mean I'm a bad person? No. Well, what is Krishna going to think? Krishna's going to know that they're integral. We are integral to the pastime. So how wonderful it is that all of these inhabitants of Vrindavan, they've had doubts. I wonder who this Krishna is. I wonder what this boy is. I wonder how it is that suddenly, for the past year, we've all been loving our children so much more. Now, yes, they did love their children, but there was something special about this love. Usually they would cook in order so that their, their children would share with Krishna. Now, they're cooking and they're cooking profusely. Preparation after preparation after preparation with so much love and I just feel like I just want to feed my child and somehow feeding my child is giving me the same joy that feeding Krishna used to give. Who is this boy? How is it that this Krishna is living amongst us? Could he be some powerful demigod? What's happening? Mother Yashoda is often accidentally seeing the universe within her son's mouth. And then at the next minute, she has to doubt it. This is the, the illusory nature of our Lord. And sometimes we hear about the illusory nature of the Lord in terms of the material potency. We hear about the, the, the material world and that's the illusory potency. This is the, the Maya that we don't want. Well, she has her she has her functions. And so sometimes we do want to be associated with her because she has a very, very special benediction. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has given her the benediction personally that for the devotees whose hearts are sincere, she can usher us closer to him. She is the one who can give us that supreme access. But then when it comes to yoga maya, we want willingly to be under her influence because she is the supreme director of all of these pastimes. And so it is by her potency, by her arrangement, that Yashoda Devi can see the universe accidentally within her son's mouth. And in the next moment, completely doubt the entire thing. It is by her arrangement that these pastimes can happen again and again, day in, day out. And everyone will forget, including Krishna, in order to have ever fresh, ever new pastimes. So sometimes, if we can recognize where these doubts are coming from, if these doubts are encouraging us to continue on with our Krishna consciousness more fiercely, then we can take them as a blessing. If these doubts are dragging us away from Krishna, if these doubts are telling us, oh no, you have no right, how can you chant properly? Better you put the beads down and just not try at all. If we listen to those doubts, those are the doubts that we want Krishna to vanquish. The doubts that have us putting our faith in someone other than Krishna. Even if we think, but Krishna is my friend. Over and above being the Supreme Person, he's, he's just my friend. Still, that should have us putting our faith completely in Krishna. Just as the cowherd boys did. They were not thinking of Krishna as a Supreme Person, but they knew he was going to save them from everything. So sometimes the doubts are integral to the pastime. And it becomes like a lifelong mission should we choose to accept it, to start recognizing the difference. I think there's one question from Sharadia. Hi Krishna, Sita Gopi Prabhu. I've got many questions. I don't know where to start. <laughs> okay, I'll start with one question. Um, I wondered if you could speak something about if there's a connection 
between our our faith and our trust in Krishna's unconditional love for us and um, having having doubts. Um, I would ask you to expound ex expound on that. Give me a little bit more. What do you mean? Sometimes I think because we are not. Um, you know, we're actually not accepting that Krishna loves us unconditionally. Um, then, as you said, that second century we have a dream, then we kind of feel like, no, you know, I couldn't have a dream like that. It's not possible for me to have a dream and that it's like really Krishna. It's almost like we are blocking ourselves. Like Krishna, like we know Krishna loves us unlimitedly, but because we're almost, um, you know, we're kind of resistant to accepting that love and then that creates a doubt. I'm, I'm not sure, so I thought maybe you have more insight. You said it. <laughs> you said it. We we don't trust it. We don't believe. We don't have that faith. And so it creates a doubt. That's it. <laughs> and and that's the thing, you know, there is no there is no magic formula. We could say it for as long as we, we want to say it, you know, in, in building this relationship with Krishna and getting to know who Krishna is. The goal is, and the effect of the goal to be known is supposed to be that we are supposed to see a lessening of these doubts and we are supposed to finally be able to believe and put faith in what Krishna says. The mind is strong. Uh, and so we have to, we have to stay on the mind. Which is why Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he actually beat the mind in the morning and in the evening. Beat the mind. Try and get it under control. Try and get it to believe what Krishna is saying. Because there is no way, I mean, you know, other than eradicating those doubts, we can only build the faith by continuing to pray to Krishna. And so one of my friends was actually asking, he was saying, you know, if the holy name can give us everything, then why isn't it? I said, well, it is. We need to have the faith. And he's like, and how do you, because he was saying, he's like, you know, what's the, what's the price for purchasing Krishna? I said, of course it's faith. He said, that's true. But how do we get that faith? I said, well, Srila Prabhupada says in Bhagavad Gita, you associate with other people who have it. Devananda Pandit. He would preach about Srimad Bhagavatam. And this is in the time of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He would preach about Srimad Bhagavatam and never talk about bhakti. And so because he would preach about Bhagavatam and never speak about devotional service, Mahaprabhu became so annoyed. And then that caused Devananda Pandit to commit offenses. Srivas came to his assembly to hear Bhagavatam and he was kicked out. People simply could not understand him or his ecstasies, and he was kicked out. Mahaprabhu became so angry with this that he started really chastising Devananda. You have no right to even speak about Bhagavatam. Who do you think you are? You've become an antagonist. Your heart is so convoluted, I myself don't even want to stay there. Yikes. And so it wasn't until Devananda Pandit began associating with Vakrishwar Pandit. He would make sure that the way was clear whenever Vakrishwar Pandit would dance. And Vakrishwar Pandit was so dear to Lord Chaitanya that after Devananda began associating with him and serving him so nicely, finally, Mahaprabhu was willing to accept him. So this faith comes from associating with people who have it. Those people where they're spiritual recharge starts to spread out in all directions and so sometimes we'll go to a retreat or we'll go to a spiritual place and we'll wonder we come back wow i feel so much better or when we first start chanting japa right after initiation everything feels invigorated and enlightened this is the effect of association we've been associating with incredibly powerful spiritual personalities these spiritual masters are not normal. And so some of their potency is spreading out 
as mercy onto us. So we have to remember, if the doubts are getting to us too much that day, have we done the checklist? Have we taken our medication? Have we chanted that day? Have we associated that day? Have we gone and looked for Krishna? Have we looked for reasons to love Krishna? Have we looked for reasons to show us that Krishna loves us that day? Have we actually done the work? Have we gone through our spiritual therapy that day? If not, the doubts are going to tear us to shreds. But it is up to us to help maintain this relationship with Krishna, just like anybody else. If we constantly were in a relationship with someone telling them, oh, you don't love me, you don't love me, you don't love me, and anything they would do, they would buy us flowers. We're like, thanks, but you don't love me. They would stop everything they were doing to come and, and, and they would do everything for us. They would plan dates and we're like, thanks, this is nice, but you don't love me. They'd buy us the most expensive thing and give it to us, thanks, but you don't love me. They'd save our lives. Thanks, that was nice, but you don't love me. Eventually, I think they would leave, but not Krishna. And every day, we wake up, we take a nice deep breath in, and then we doubt that Krishna loves us at all. And not because Krishna has done anything. Just us and the mind. So in building this relationship with Krishna, have we actually taken our spiritual therapy to heart? Have we chanted that day? Have we looked for Krishna, for reasons that, that Krishna loves us? Have we looked for evidence? Because I guarantee you it's there every day. And then, and then, if we still have doubts, we run to Krishna. Oh Lord, these doubts are bigger than me. But I've done the work, I promise you today. Even on the days when we find that we can't even muster up enough energy to do the work, we should still pray. Oh Lord, you said... You would carry what I lack and preserve what I have. Today, I'm lacking. In fact, every day I'm lacking. Lord, just carry me. Lord, just turn me into a backpack, put me on shoulders. It's fine. That'll be my constitutional position. So what happens if the doubts don't stop? Do we allow them to drag us away from Krishna? Or do we develop a fortitude stronger than that? With faith in our relationship with Krishna. My goal, I'm, I'm trying, hopefully, to develop a faith in my relationship with Krishna that goes beyond the doubts. Yes, the doubts will happen. And then I ask the Lord, why did you inspire me from within? This is the, the lesson of this pastime. We can speak with the Lord and ask him to inspire us from within. He says, I am seated within the hearts and from me come all remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. By all the Vedas, I am to be known. Indeed, I'm the compiler of the Vedas and the knower of Vedanta. We have to have faith in that. Our Lord will inspire us from within. I think there may be time just for one more. Hare Krishna. All right, I'll be very quick. <laughs> that was a wonderful answer. So I was, um, I really enjoyed the, the first time of Chanda the day, and it's it's amazing how, you know, she went into this epileptic state when her family members were, you know, kind of trying to not prevent but not allowing her to marry Bhagavan Chanda. But it, it's I found it fascinating. So I was wondering if you could say something more about it. That later in her life, when Lord Chanda is not present, you know, she does continue, and she plays quite a significant role in the the Vaishnava community so how like can you can you elaborate on how did she how was she able to do that to continue and to do so much service and play such an important role in the absence of Lord Nichananda because it couldn't have been easy what do you mean we must, uh, because she was I mean we, we know that at the time that Lord Nichananda left she was in some ways considered like in the most senior Vaishnava yeah and then she was then like, you know, kind of like the guru, etc. But if we understand like, you know, the, the culture at that point in time, it couldn't have been an easy position, especially that she was a woman and she was like a, a widowed woman. And so I'm just thinking that it must have been shanty for her, um, you know, to take on that role, but she did. The, she, she did. 
For for Lord Chaitanya's associates, um, that decision was unanimous. But who within Lord Chaitanya's associates was an acceptable member of society? Nityananda Prabhu himself was an outcast. Uh, Haridas was a Muslim and untouchable. So this was nothing new. Lord Chaitanya almost had like a band of misfits, you know, like everybody came from different parts of society. And once you joined Lord Chaitanya, everybody else in the reputable part of society was, oh, they've gone and joined that, that, that place. They've gone over there with the Hare Krishnas. In fact, this Hare Krishna Ma Mantra wasn't even supposed to be sung quite like that. Um, within the Vedas, etc., Hare Rama comes first. And if you hear today at the end of any Ganesh Arti, they sing the Maha Mantra. And Hare Rama is first. Because that's how it originally was. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu changed the Maha Mantra and switched and put Hare Krishna first. So everyone within Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's association was revolutionary. Rupa Goswami and Sanatan Goswami were not accepted members of Hindu society at that time. They had been working, they were originally in a family of Brahmins, and they were working for the Muslim ruler. They didn't want to accept them back. Lord Chaitanya had lepers and all kinds of people in his association. So the decision between uh, the Vaishnavas at that time to accept Janava Devi was unanimous. They understood that she was, and it's in her own pranam mantra, that she is Nityananda Shakti. She is the Shakti of Lord Nityananda. They understood that, cent for cent. Um, outside, she had death threats. There were people that were coming to kill her, all kinds of things, but she was personally protected uh, by, by so many personalities, including uh, the goddess Durga herself. There were other Hindus who were trying to kill her, and they were worshippers of the goddess Durga. And goddess Durga appeared before them and struck fear into their hearts the fear of God into their entire hearts. And she's saying, this, this Janava Devi is non-different from me. Where do you think I get my own power from? I pray to her for my own power. How dare you? So, no, it wasn't easy. And still she just continued. Uh, she, she looked ahead and she kept going. She simply did not stop. And um, and so my, my sister has a really, really simple way of looking at things sometimes. Uh, we tend to complicate it, but my sister gets really simple. Sometimes I'll say, wow, it's another birthday. And she says, well, you didn't die. That's how you got here. And for her, it's just that simple. You're still here, means you didn't die. And so it is as simple as that. How do, we, how do we continue going in our Krishna consciousness day by day? You simply don't stop. We keep going. How do we maintain our relationship with Krishna every day? We simply keep going. Not easy, but it is as simple as that. We find a way every day to simply keep going. And so Janava Devi just kept going. She just kept continuing with her Krishna consciousness. Spreading Krishna, being there for the devotees, establishing and creating festivals. And so I've even, I think there is a, there's at least one or two lectures that we've done on Janava Devi. So I do hope that you're able all to go in and, and check them out in the archives. Thank you so much. So wonderful to be with all of you. Have a day with Kija. Jai. Shita Gopi day with Kija. Shita Gopi day with Kija. Shita Gopi, wonderful class, beautiful. Bhima Prabhu said that in the, in the chat that he had to stop his truck to properly appreciate the point. <laughs> I did see of, uh, Worshiping the, uh, the deity of our doubts. We have a, a truckload of doubts. We just keep on going. And 
Just keep going every day. How do you keep going by keeping going? I love that. Very simple. And um, yeah, very inspiring. Shri Gopi, you're the best Gashi speaker. Thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you everybody. Rich, Akiko Chan, Betty, Jason, Yogeshwari, Baudevi, Suzanne, Amish, Priti Chaturvedi, Jamuna Jai, Harvadeshwari, Venetia, Andi, Pink Yogam, Holland, Eric, Kartik, Sarah.